Thank you all so much for tuning in and joining us for a few moments of worship and a few brief words of encouragement from Pastor Jordan. Feel free to chat down in the comments below, but I do encourage you to take some notes. Right after service, we're going to host a live Zoom call and a Kahoot game, and whoever wins the Kahoot game gets a free pizza delivered to their door, so you don't want to miss that. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and I can't wait to see you all on Zoom.
much for tuning in. I hope you are doing well uh, wherever you are in your week this week. I hope you are staying safe and practicing all of the safety measures um, that, that are supposed to be keeping us safe during this time of such craziness. Um, I won't take up too much of our time this evening because we do need to uh, get on to our Zoom call where we will be giving away a free pizza delivered straight to your door. Uh, all you have to do is win the Kahoot game. That's it. All you have to do is win. Uh, all of that material in the Kahoot will be based off of the content that we cover right here and now. So without further ado, I wanted to start off by just asking you guys a question. Can you remember a time, whether it be in a class or maybe a public speaking event, you know, but let's just use a classroom, for example, where the teacher called you out, you were sitting there minding your own business, you didn't raise your hand, but the teacher called you out specifically by name, by what you were wearing, whatever, and expected you to answer a question? You know, even if you do know the answer to that question, it's still pretty awkward to be in that position, isn't it? even more awkward if you don't know the answer to that question at that point you either have to admit that you haven't been paying attention the entire time or you have to scramble around for some answer that doesn't make you look that stupid either way that's still embarrassing whatever boat you find yourself in um, but as i was i was reading scripture and going over really this the, this easter weekend um, and looking through, just kind of getting a refresher of everything that Christ did for us, I found a scenario that's not too far from that experience. You see, everything was pretty much, as I remembered it, pretty hand-in-hand hand from the Easter story. Um, it starts out uh, with Christ enjoying the, the very last supper with his disciples, and from that table Judas gets up and he goes to betray Jesus and Jesus and some a few of the disciples they go to the garden and they're they're praying there where G Judas comes back with some Jewish officials um, to arrest Jesus and take him before Pilate who who is supposed to judge on Jesus's uh, death sentence so so to speak um, and eventually and although reluctantly he does uh, give the order for Christ to be crucified and he's taken and he's whipped and beaten given 39 lashes um, beaten beyond recognition human recognition and then taken up uh, to the cross nailed to the cross where he eventually utters the words it is finished and he dies uh, three days later he is resurrected he spends the next 40 days with us on earth before ascending into heaven. And in between does countless incredible things, um, both symbolic and, and very practical uh, for us as the human race and, and as his children. Pretty pretty incredible when you when you get through all the all the ins and outs of, of all that is there. But one detail that kind of caught me off guard was this scenario that I mentioned that's at first, when you look at it, it seems pretty, pretty random and even a little, a little awkward, too. Um, it happens right after Christ takes the absolute beating of a lifetime, and right before he's hung on the cross. It, it says, says this in Luke chapter 23 verse 26 a scripture reads as the soldiers led him away him being jesus um, they seized simon from cyrene who was on his way from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind jesus now you have uh, the bible has what we call four gospels they are matthew mark luke and john and you can see this account of the crucifixion in all four Gospels. However, the Gospel of John has no mention of Simon uh, whatsoever. Uh, Matthew and Mark, those uh, accounts are, are pretty identical. But the one in Luke is the only one that says that it gives kind of the best description and the most me. It's even still, it's only one verse. Um, tells us where he is from. What, and uh, gives us no inclination as to 
really what he's doing in the city um, and tells us that he carried the cross and he carried it um, behind Jesus. But nevertheless, this is a very awkward moment in Scripture. I mean, here we uh, have the, the, the crucifixion of the Messiah, the only one who has ever lived throughout all of human history that is capable of atoning, of atoning for the sin of man because he lived a life that was uh, without sin, and he is the Son of God, this is, this is the moment where he does it all. And from that, we, we, we do see that. We see um, even going all the way back to the Last Supper. You know, it's, it's, it's all Jesus praying in the garden. It's all Jesus um, standing before Pilate. It's all Jesus being uh, beaten and, and bruised and, and wounded. It's all Jesus hanging on the cross. It's all Jesus. There in the middle, there's just this insert of this random traveler named Simon. The Bible calls him Simon of Cyrene. Awkward for, for Simon as well, no doubt. I mean, here he is, not from Jerusalem where all of this is taking place. Um, he, maybe he's there for the Jewish Passover. Maybe he's there for the census that is taking place somewhere close to this time. Scripture isn't clear on that, but we know he's there. He's in the crowd, and all of a sudden he's seized by Roman officials, and he's told to participate in a total stranger's death sentence. It's incredibly awkward not only for Simon, but for the rest of mankind as well. Because once again, here we see this is the crucifixion of Jesus, and yet we have this random stranger that is kind of picked out of the crowd at random to help the Messiah fulfill the, the atonement of sin. Now, in, in no way am I, I you know, trying to uh, disregard what Christ did or or make little of what he was going through. There's no doubt in my mind that his body was in absolute anguish. I myself would have most likely died before I even got the chance to see the cross. In fact, um, some scholars uh, are quite certain that there were quite a few men that died on, on the whipping post. Um, and the just sheer amount of blood and exhaustion that his body was in at that moment would have made that a pretty clear possibility. But nevertheless, we see this random traveler inserted into the story. And at face value, we can see he does have a pretty practical purpose in that. But if we look at Scripture, I think God's trying to reveal something a little bit deeper. You see, 14 chapters previous to this, um, in Luke chapter 9, no one on the planet knows that Jesus is going to die on a cross. Um, outside of Jesus, who is, at this time is predicting his death. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That was 14 chapters. Nobody knew that Christ was going to be hanging on a cross, let alone that Simon of Cyrene, whoever that is, is going to be literally taking up a cross and following him up the hill. I can't help but think the disciples standing at a distance watching all of this go down and say, Oh, that's what he meant. But what does it mean for you and me? What does it mean to take up our cross, and follow Jesus. You see, just as Simon stepped out of the crowd, you and I have to step out of the crowd. Outside of the norms, outside of the ordinaries, outside of what we want to do, and we have to submit ourselves to something that is so much greater than that. You see, Simon was in somewhat of an angry mob at the time. Most people were, were hurling insults, hurling rocks at Jesus, spitting on him, beating him, mocking him the entire way he's up to the, the most miserable death this world has ever seen. 
But nevertheless, you and I are called to step out of the crowd knowing that we're probably going to have rocks thrown at us. We're probably going to get spit on. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that you will be made fun of for sharing the gospel. But nevertheless, that is what we're called to do. Why? Because Jesus asked us to? Because Jesus said so? I think there's quite a bit much more than that. I think we do this because there are lost, dying, and hurting people in this world that need to hear that there's a God that loves them so much that he gave his only son to die for them. And that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And in order for the power of the cross to reach its intended destination, God wants to use random, ordinary strangers like you and me to deliver it. What does it mean to pick up your cross and to, to carry, and carry the gospel and to follow Jesus? Well, it means to become a, a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus. Not just a, a, a follower in a, in a fan club or a follower as you would follow someone on Twitter, but no, to be willing to lay down your life and to abandon everything to become like Jesus. You know, Scripture doesn't give us very much more on this, this Simon of Cyrene. But it does talk about his family, specifically his son and his wife. Uh, you see, there was this man, his name was Saul. Um, and Saul's number one goal in, to, in life was to kill as many Christians as he could. Um, that was his, his MO, so to speak. And then one day, God radically gets a hold of his life. He takes away his sight, blinds him, um, so that he can see the error of his own ways. And then he restores his sight. And um, this man named Saul gives his life to Christ, and um, God actually changes his name to Paul. And Paul will go on to write the majority of what you and I would call the New Testament. And in this New Testament, in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, he mentions Simon's family. He says, Greet Rufus, Simon's son, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who has been a mother to me, too. Now, Scripture isn't clear on what I'm about to say. They make no mention of it, but I personally can't help but think that there was a very personal and intimate relationship between Simon of Cyrene and Paul, writer of the New Testament. I mean, after all, if you call someone your mother that's not actually your mother, you probably have a pretty close bond to that individual and that family. But that, again, that's, that's just me. But it's incredible to think that the individual that carried the cross of Jesus Christ had a little bit to do, maybe a lot of it to do, with the, disciple, this, the discipleship and development of the man who would write the New Testament. And that provokes another thought. What would happen if we gave God our yes? What would happen if we answered the call to become real-life disciples of Christ? What if when asked to take up our cross and follow Him, we gave Jesus our absolute and undivided yes? What could happen? I'll pose the question to you this way. If you don't share Jesus with the people in your life, who's going to do it? The girl in, in your school that walks around and all that she can think about is killing herself. Or the guy that parties and, and takes drugs and tries to escape the trauma that was caused by uh, his, his own dad. Who's going to tell those people that there's a Father in Heaven that loves them so much that He gave His only Son to die for them so that He could know them? You know, if any of that strikes a chord with you, if any of that speaks to your spirit and speaks to your heart, and you say, Pastor Jordan, that's me, 
I want to answer the call. I want to say yes. I want to give Jesus my yes. I want to pick up my cross and I want to carry it and I want to follow Jesus. If that's you, normally in this situation, I would just ask that you would raise your hand in, in, in a, a, a group setting. But in this case, I want to ask you to post in the comments below, that's me. That's it. That's me. Because I want to reach out to you one-on-one -on -one and I want to pray with you. And I want to talk to you. I want to give you some tools that, that might help you in that, that endeavor. And I want to help you grow closer to that. But maybe you're in another boat uh, tonight and you're viewing this and you say, Pastor Jordan, I don't know that I really have a relationship with Christ. But I want one. And I want to become a follower of Christ. If that's you and you want to make the Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, your personal Lord and Savior, I would ask you to do the same thing. Just comment in the comments below, that's me too. If you're in the second book, that's me too. And I want to pray with you right here and now. It's a very simple prayer, but Scripture tells us that if we mean it from the bottom of our hearts, that it's a powerful prayer, and it's heard by heaven. And we come in unity with Christ, in unity with God. So if you would, just repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your one and only Son to die for me. Father, I can't comprehend the love that you have for me, but I thank you for it. I ask that you would come right now, Holy Spirit, that you would forgive me of all my sin, that you would take away my past, and that you would give me a hope and a future in you, Jesus. And in the best way I know how, I give you my life. I pray that you would help me right now, today, and every day moving forward to follow you as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, if that's you and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I am so excited for you. I'm so excited for the work that Jesus is doing in you and that he's going to continue to do in you. Um, E-Youth, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we need to wrap this up because we have got a Zoom meeting in, well... Right now. Dinosaurs on the ark? Oh, 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 oh,